Hi, everyone. This is Lauren Baker, founder of Search Engine Journal. Uh, thank you for attending today's special SEJ marketing think tank. With me, I have Pat Petriello of CPC Strategy. Please say hi, Pat. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. Appreciate it. You're welcome. So um, I'll do. A, I'll let Pat introduce himself and talk a little bit about what we'll be presenting today on <clears throat> Amazon's search engine ranking algorithm. But before I get started, let me go ahead and do some quick housekeeping uh, to let all of you know uh, how to handle a uh, GoToWebinar. So, and for all of you that are first timers to our SEJ Think Tank webinars. So as you see, we have a GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, within that panel, I'd like to do a call out to our handout section. Pat and the team at CPC Strategy have been kind enough to give us several different PDFs that you can download that go deeper into the information that he'll be presenting today. Also, you'll see a question box um, in the control panel as well. Uh, typically with our um, think tank webinars, uh, we go through the presentation, and as you have questions, please feel free to type them into the box. After the presentation's over, then we'll go into maybe a 15 or 20 minute Q&A session uh, to let Pat answer those questions uh, that have come up during the presentation. If I see that a lot of you are having very interesting questions during Pat's presentation, Pat, I'm just going to interrupt you and let you know and ask the question. That way we can make sure um, you know, as those questions come up that are uh, for a certain slide or maybe a study, you can go into it uh, then and there. Um, also, uh, we have some polls that we'll be launching uh, during the presentation. So we love to get your feedback, uh, some information from you. I will ask you some simple multiple choice questions, college flashbacks, I'm sure. And then uh, Pat will be able to really craft this presentation around a lot of your feedback. And uh, that's pretty much it. The official hashtag is hashtag SEJ Think Tank. So if you have a chance, please go on Twitter or your social network of choice and let people know that you're attending today. And Pat, I'm going to hand things over to you. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Lauren. And thank you, everybody, for joining. As, as Lauren mentioned as well, always welcome for, for feedback and questions. The goal of this is to make sure that this is time well spent for you and that you get extract maximum value out of this presentation. So looking forward to some questions and to seeing where your businesses are at through those poll questions as well. So without further ado, today what we're talking about is demystifying Amazon's search engine algorithm, which is a fancy way of saying we're going to talk about the Amazon SERP, the search engine results page, and why products show up on Amazon in the way that they do when you or your customers or your potential customers go to Amazon and search for products as they are want to do. Before we get into that, a little bit about CPC Strategy. CPC Strategy was founded in 2007. We have over 500 active retail clients. We sit at the intersection of Google, Facebook, Instagram, and of course, Amazon, which is what we'll be speaking about today. Um, we have a focus on digital retail search at every level of the funnel, which is to say through demand generation, through Amazon, AAP, display advertising and the Google Display Network, all the way down to traffic conversion optimization, detail page optimization, written content, images, EBC, which we'll get into a lot of these things today, on the detail page. So it really is that full service approach to how do we find more potential customers, get them to your products, and then increase the rate at which they convert. Um, as I mentioned, we sit at the intersection of the major platforms where your shoppers go to shop and go to interact with your products. So that's a little bit about CPC. Of course, you can find us, check out our website if you are interested in more. My name is Pat Petriello. This is my extremely serious looking photo on the screen, which I always enjoy. I'm the head of marketplace strategy here at CPC Strategy. I founded CPC Strategy's Amazon department about just about five years ago. I previously was up in Seattle working for Amazon in their seller services division, or as I like to call it, up in the mothership. And then prior to that, I was a professional seller on the marketplace as well in the wireless accessory space. So cases, screen protectors, covers, headsets, things of that nature. So I've interacted with the marketplace from the brand side at Amazon itself, and now on the agency side representing uh, multiple hundreds of brands and spanning most verticals. So 
a vast experience interacting with Amazon from a, def, a, a number of different angles. So making sure you're in the right place and that your expectations are set correctly about what you're looking to get out of today's webinar. We're going to talk about the A9 algorithm, which again, Amazon's A9 algorithm, it's, it's just their, their search ranking algorithm. The differences between Google and Amazon, and those will be top level differences. And I don't want to present myself as a Google expert. I'm sure there are many of you who are attending today who could, uh, who, who have more insight into the Google algorithm than I do, but we'll talk a little bit about that to draw some parallels between the two platforms. They are not identical. The direct and indirect factors that drive the algorithm, that's really the meat of what we want to talk about today, is what are the things that actually drive how Amazon surfaces products on the SERP, and what levers can you pull as a marketer, as a brand, as a seller to influence that? And then that segues into the final piece, which is just takeaways, things you can actually take away and do after this webinar. And as well, we will also have the live Q&A at the end that Lauren mentioned. So excited to cover all these things with you today. I think that we actually jump into our first poll question here. And, and Lauren, I think you can go Excellent. launch this. Oh yeah, go for it. Yeah, here we go. So first poll question, what's the biggest challenge your business faces on Amazon? Is it ranking higher on the results page, scaling your business on Amazon, efficient advertising campaigns, or general lack of understanding of how Amazon works. So we've had about 25% of you vote thus far. We really like to get around the 75 to 80% mark. So if you could just take the time and choose which one better to find your largest challenge uh, on Amazon, that would be fantastic. So I see we're at 65%. I'll give you a few more seconds. Five, four, Three, two, all right, final chance to get your vote in. One, I'm going to close the poll at 75%. And here are the results, Pat. You know, and Lauren, actually, I can't see them. So could you just maybe tell me what the top result was? Oh, really? Uh, okay. So the top result is 42% um, have said that the general lack of understanding of how Amazon works is their largest challenge. And then 32% is ranking higher on the results page uh, with 14 and 12% coming in at efficient advertising campaigns and scaling business on Amazon. Awesome, thank you. That's actually really useful and I'm really happy to hear that feedback because we'll talk quite a bit about a general understanding of how Amazon works here. And the whole point of this webinar is to address how to rank higher on the results page so rest assured you've come to the right place. And if there's any questions beyond that, of course, there's an opportunity at the end to answer those. So thank you for that. And let's actually get into it here. So I think a logical place to begin is what is Amazon's A9 algorithm? What is it that we're actually talking about today? And you can actually go into your web browser and go to a9.com and you'll see that Amazon has actually a separately incorporated company called A9 with their own patents and their own search and research patents. And what A9 is, it's the search engine which powers Amazon's search bar. So when you search for a product in Amazon, you go there, you search hiking boots, or you search, what did I buy recently? That's embarrassing. A, a, a dog kitty pool. Uh, I'm in Southern California and it's about 90 degrees here, so I have to keep keep the pooch cool. And so and so Amazon's A9 algorithm is what takes your search input, the actual words you type in, and it produces a relevant SERP. And when I say SERP, I'm talking about the search engine results page. And it's not magic, of course, what's driving that. And it's not a human sitting there and populating those products in a millisecond. It's an algorithm that's using different input factors to determine which products make the most sense to populate that search. And essentially, it's the reason we keep coming back to Amazon, right? There's that level of trust that when you put a search query into the search bar, Amazon is going to return the products that are the best fit and the most relevant. And we'll unpack the word relevancy a little bit later on to be purchased. And that's what the A9 algorithm is. Of course, it's really important because think about, and I'm assuming many of you are Amazon shoppers, many of you are probably prime members. Think about how people discover products on the marketplace. An overwhelming amount of product discoverability on the marketplace is through search. So people are coming to amazon.com, they're searching in the, in the search bar what they're looking for, 
and then that's how they're discovering and selecting new products, which is really half of the battle of selling on Amazon is making sure you get found. Some data that Amazon sent over that actually backs that up, you can see in the screen here, is the vast majority of customers never click past the first page. We had a really lame joke when I worked at Amazon that said, what's the best place to bury the body? It was page two of the search results because nobody's ever gonna look there. And some real eye roller, but you get the point, is that the vast majority of products are found on the first page of the SERP, which means understanding how this algorithm works and understanding what it takes to show up on the first page of that search engine results page is really important in terms of driving incremental sales for your business and for launching new products and saying, hey, how do I get these new products to get found? My understanding is that a number of you are coming from a background of Google understanding and understanding a little bit how the Google SERP works. And so let's, let's spend some time to draw some comparisons between those two. And that will set a little bit of context around the conversation when we unpack how the direct factors influence Amazon's A9 algorithm. And the first and the most obvious is the primary search intent of the two platforms, which is to say, why are people going to Google versus why are people going to Amazon? And of course, this is not 100% for each, but generally there's higher purchase intent for customers that are going to Amazon. Their goal is to search for a product, find it and buy it, Amazon has the highest conversion rates anywhere on the internet. That's the reason that products are there. That's the reason that brands want to get their products there. People are going there to buy. Google has a higher research intent. And obviously a lot of what Google searches are, are not product bases. It might be, you know, what's the population of Delaware or how many countries are there in Africa or things of that type of nature. And so the intent for shoppers on Google or for browsers on Google is research. It's to, it's to engage. It's to find an answer to a question. And that purchase intent versus that research intent backs into the metrics that are most important and defining the metrics that you're going to use to define success on Amazon versus Google. And even the word relevance is quite subjective. If I say, oh, that's a very relevant product, Somebody sitting next to me might disagree because relevance has no absolute meaning. So the way Amazon defines relevancy is it looks at what people are purchasing after conducting a search. That's their highest signal for the proper product to show up on the SERP for a given search. And as from a metric standpoint, Amazon uses actual sales conversions and sales velocity and we'll get into a little bit more specifics of that sales velocity and even the, the window that Amazon's looking at that as the highest indicators, the most important indicators of what products make sense. You, anecdotally, you know, if you search Amazon for a pair of sunglasses, you're not going to get a lot of water bottles on the search engine result page. It doesn't mean that the water bottles aren't good. It means that it's, it's not relevant. People aren't searching sunglasses and then buying a water bottle because their search intent is for sunglasses. And so Amazon is saying, okay, if this product, if this pair of sunglasses gets bought frequently, a hundred times a day, a thousand times a day, whatever it might be for the search sunglasses, that's a really strong indicator to Amazon that says, hey, this is matching customer demand. This is satisfying a need. Let's continue to show this product. On the other side, Google's defining relevancy as what a person clicks on to answer their question and also looking at engagement behavior, the number of clicks to the page, bounce rate, time on site, backlinks, all those different things. And, and backlinks makes me think of one of the other differences here is, is Amazon is very structured data. You essentially have an Excel sheet of, of product content, titles, bullet points, search terms, color, size, manufacturer, brand, all those different things that you fulfill those fields and that makes up and constitutes your Amazon product content. On Google, it's essentially an open field. You have, you are only limited to how capable and creative your development team is. And so those are some of the differences between Amazon and Google. And to keep in mind throughout the rest of this is that sales velocity and conversions are really are what's going to drive that SERP and what products show up in the SERP. And that's a thread that will follow us throughout this. So understanding what the A9 algorithm is and why it's important because 
quite frankly, people don't make it to the second page very often, and understanding a little bit how that differs in how Google works, let's unpack a little bit the direct and the indirect factors that influence the algorithm. algorithm. Essentially, how does this thing work? That's my dramatic pause while I take a sip of water as well. So one of the interesting things, and you've probably noticed this too, just reading on the internet about Amazon search algorithm is there's a, a ton of conspiracy theories and misinformation about, oh, I think it works like this, or I think it works like that. And that's understandable because for the most part, Amazon is pretty opaque as it comes to showing information and telling us how their systems work. However, when Amazon's talking about how products show up for search, they're actually pretty clear. This blurb on the screen here is from within Amazon Seller Central. If you search their help pages for optimized listings for search, they tell you right there in black and white, customer search by entering keywords, which are then matched against product information, title, description, and so on. Even so on, I find interesting that Amazon uses a vague term such as so on. And then they use factors such as degree of text match. Again, text match, that's why you don't see water bottles for sunglasses, no text match. Price, I'm sure you know, as you've shopped on Amazon, that typically lower priced products tend to show higher on the SERP. Availability, there's no worse experience than shopping online, finding the product you want, navigating to the detail page and finding out that it's out of stock. Selection and sales history. And the sales history is really what we call sales velocity a moment ago. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And those things determine where your product appears in a customer search result. So this is not Pat's opinion. This is not CPC strategy's opinion. This is not a theory. This is what Amazon is actually telling us, hey, these are the things which matter and impact the ability for your product to get found. They even say at the end, by providing as much content as possible, you increase your product's visibility and sales. Wonderful. So let's not guess. Let's use Amazon's actual description of how this works as a North Star for strategic decision making when it comes to how we think about content. <clears throat> Putting all of those factors into an easy to consume graphic, and we'll revisit this later, is the direct factors and the indirect factors which drive sales velocity. So let's start from the place of understanding that sales velocity is the most important factor for determining where products show up on the search engine results page. A common question is, how do I rank higher? How do I go from page five to page three, from page three to page two, and so on. And annoyingly, the most important thing, the most powerful thing you can do to increase your search ranking is to increase your sales velocity, is to sell more, which is of course a little bit chicken and the egg because as your product sells more, it rises up the rankings. As it rises up the rankings, it gets found more. As it gets found more, it gets sold more, and so on. So that sales velocity is a relative number based on competitors for that same search term. When we say direct factors, what we mean by direct factors are things that Amazon can actually scan and index and use to make, and that A9 system can use to make a decision. So Amazon can scan for price, for text match relevancy, of course, that's we just saw in that last paragraph, for availability to make sure it's in stock. The bottom factors are not items that, the indirect factors are not items that Amazon is scanning for and ranking you by, but they're all extremely powerful factors that drive sales velocity. Fulfillment method. FBA is fulfillment by Amazon. There's FBM, which is fulfillment by merchant. The fulfillment method has a significant impact on conversion rate. Products that are fulfilled by Amazon, available for two-day prime shipping, convert at a much higher rate than products which are not. Therefore, that has a major impact on sales velocity. Reviews, pretty intuitive. Guess what? Products that are reviewed better and have more reviews tend to have convert, higher conversion rates than product that are reviewed, products which are reviewed worse and have a low volume of reviews. High quality images, which go along with EBC and A plus content. We'll talk about that more in this presentation as well. These are all things which influence a customer's level of trust. And that trust is what allows them to go from consideration to conversion. Advertising, advertising is probably the most powerful of the indirect factors in driving sales velocity. That's especially true in the last 
two years as Amazon has really shifted to an advertising heavy focus. You can even see that in terms of where paid placements are on the SERP. No different than how Google has evolved in that time where paid placements are now all above the fold you know, when a search is made. And then of course, promotions are pretty intuitive as well as a mechanism and a tool to drive incremental sales velocity. So the direct factors, things that Amazon is scanning for, hey, they can scan price. Okay, you're at $10, you're at $15, take that into account. The indirect factors, these are the things that you as an advertiser or as a marketer, as a brand, these are levers you can pull to help influence that sales velocity. All right. So as I just mentioned and alluded to, and not even alluded to, but addressed directly, is that sales velocity is the most important factor. And that's why we put that at the center of our graphic there in the last slide, is that increasing sales velocity is the most effective way to rank higher. As I mentioned, you wanna rank higher, sell more. That's actually the most effective way to do it, which says, okay, great, that doesn't really help me. How do I sell more? We'll talk about that a little bit too. I also mentioned the relativity and the weighting of sales velocity. So Amazon is very much a, a ruthless meritocracy and a what have you done for me lately? Meaning if you've been a seller on Amazon since 2008, they're not just gonna say, oh, you've accrued a ton of sales over the last decade or whatever it might be. They wanna know what product has sold the most in the last 30 days, the last 60 days, in the last two weeks. So they're looking at a recency bias. What this allows for is challenger brands on Amazon to actually make significant headway if their products are selling well. I don't wanna to go to Amazon, search for water bottle, and see the same water bottles that you've seen on the first page of the Amazon SERP for the last 10 years. Maybe Hydroflask, which is the water bottle I have right here, they're not a client, I just happen to use it. Let's say they come along two years ago and they're the new water bottle thing and everybody's going nuts for them and they have a celebrity endorsement. If they start to pick up steam and people search for water bottle and buy Hydroflask water bottles, they'll start to rise up the SERP. And then sales velocity is also used as a measure of conversion of course, Amazon wants to know who is buying what when they put in a given keyword search. And that's how you want to think about this. Essentially, it's by keyword. A lot of people say, oh, I rank on page one for my product. And that's kind of an incomplete sentence because your ranking for a product, your organic ranking is relative to a search term. You might rank on page one for sunglasses, but you might not rank on page one for a bicycle biking polarized scratch resistant sunglasses because those are different search terms with different search intent they're going to produce different search results you can even see actually um, amazon claims that they take into account plurals which is um, multiples of something you can even see that that's not necessarily the case if you search amazon for a grill glove and then search amazon again for grill gloves and compare the search results you get you'll see that they're going to be different. I think that actually opens up uh, our poll question number two, Lauren. Absolutely, Pat. Thank you. And um, just to let you know, we have a lot of questions coming in. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> I'll ask you one that's uh, pretty relevant to what you're just, just discussing. Um, how much does running an advertising campaign on Amazon affect overall sales velocity? velocity from a ranking campaign. So does do paid ads mm -hmm. and running a paid ad campaign end up helping with overall organic ranking in the A9 algo? Yeah, great question. And we're going to touch on advertising in a few slides here as well. But the answer to that question is yes, is that that sales velocity is taking into account sales from any source. So if you sold 100 products a day and 60 of those came through organic and 40 of those came through paid placements, all hundred of those are gonna count. And so you could see, let's say you started from a place of only selling 60 units a day and you wanted to get to hundred. If you could supplement that with 40 units a day of paid sales, all of that is gonna count. And so that's why, that's why I even mentioned in that graphic that advertising is one of the most powerful le levers because you can drive a tremendous amount of incremental sales using those paid placements. Awesome, thank you. So we've just launched the poll. Um, what Amazon platform are you currently selling on? Uh, one, Seller Central, two, Vendor Central, 
uh, three, seller and vendor central, or four, you're not currently selling on Amazon. So we've had about 60% answer. Um, I'll give you a couple seconds to take this up to the 75, 80% level again. So go ahead, if you haven't uh, cast your vote yet, go ahead and do it now. I'll do a quick little countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, final chance. And let's go. Sharing the results. Not sure if you can see this time or not, Pat, but I'll go through them real quick. 47% of attendees are currently not selling on Amazon. 33% uh, are utilizing Seller Central. 14% are utilizing Seller and Vendor Central. And 7% are only utilizing Vendor Central. So again, 47% not selling, 33% seller, 14% seller and vend vendor, and then 7% vendor. So I'm going to go ahead and hide the results right now. That's a, that's really interesting. I uh, thank you for relaying yeah. the, the, the to me. And so I should I think it makes sense then just for me to quickly provide some some clarity around this too because about half of you are not selling on Amazon. You might be asking, I don't know what the heck seller central or vendor central are. So just very briefly, Seller Central is what we call third-party sellers. It's essentially a way for you to create a seller account on the marketplace so that you can sell your products directly to consumers with the marketplace just being the medium. You're not actually doing business with Amazon. You just happen to be showing your product on Amazon, and that's where you can find your buyers. Vendor Central is more of a traditional wholesale relationship. It's no different than selling to Costco or, or Best Buy or Walmart or something like that, where Amazon is actually your customer and they are buying in bulk through the issue of POs, purchase orders. And so Vendor Central is more of that traditional wholesale relationship. Seller Central is a, a direct to consumer marketplace presence. So if there's any questions about that too, we will uh, we'll definitely be sure to get to them at the end. And just real quick, Pat, we had a couple of folks chime in in the question box saying that they're not selling on any of those, but they are sen selling on Kindle and CreateSpace for publishers. Oh, interesting. Okay, good. The Publisher Network. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Well, it looks like Lauren set me up for this, and maybe he did a little bit. But a good segue from that question, which just got asked, is hmm, what's the most powerful lever to increase sales, which we talked about sits at the center of that graphic to drive sales velocity, increase your organic ranking, and it's advertising. And you can go do a search on, on Amazon right now, or you know maybe you wait till this is over, whatever you choose to do. I'm not going to tell you what to do, is you search on Amazon, and you'll find on the SERP a number of different paid placements. And these are the three basic ones, headline search ads, product display ads, and sponsored products. The most powerful of these is sponsored products. If I were to make the closest analogy, you'd think of sponsored products almost like Google Shopping in, in terms of how they compare. The, the most significant advertising volume on Amazon gets driven through sponsored products. I'd say about 85% of advertising revenue on average comes through sponsored products. Another 10% through HSAs, which are the headline search ads. The headline search ads are the banner ads that you see at the top of a SERP when you search in for a product. So you'll see that frequently. It says sponsored by whomever the advertiser is. And in product display ads, you will see these actually on detail pages. So these are more bottom of the funnel right before somebody's about to check out. It'll be a, an ad for a related product that says, hey, have you also considered this? Speaking of the funnel, that's where these ads are intended to sit at different layers in the purchase intent funnel. So you're touching your consumers at different points of their journey. And so depending, of course, this is generalizations because there's, there's branded traffic and there's non-branded traffic, and those are going to sit at different points of the purchase intent funnel as well. But generally speaking, again, for those of you who are maybe not selling on Amazon or who just want to understand the basics, is you have headlines, search ads, those are the banners that are on a, a SERP page when somebody searches for either a brand name or searches for a non-branded general keyword, you'll see these show up. They drive back to either a list of product detail pages or Amazon actually has their own stores. Amazon stores, if you're a brand, you can build out essentially your own storefront. Think of it almost like a microsite version 
of your e-commerce site. Sponsor products sit in the middle and the bottom of the funnel. So they show up on every SERP uh, on Amazon just about, except for maybe a few categories, and they drive specifically back to a, right to a detail page. So you don't have to create a landing page for these ads. The landing page is your detail page. And then product display ads are those ads which show up in a number of places, but you most commonly see them on the detail page themselves, right beneath the buy box. And the buy box is the, the orange rectangle that basically says at the cart, pretty important function of Amazon, otherwise it wouldn't work super well at all. So utilization of these three ad units, one of the most important ways and powerful ways that you can drive more traffic and more sales for your products. Wonderful. Half the battle, as I opened with, is getting people to find your products and using advertising to drive them back to your detail page. Once they're there, and this is no different than any other marketing online, the goal is to maximize the rate at which those buyers convert. So if you get 100 people to your page, not all 100 are going to, to purchase, although that would be great. And you have to use a combination of your images, your the reviews, any coupons, promotions, discount, written content, and high quality images to essentially mimic the experience of a shopper purchasing a product in a brick and mortar store and mimicking that experience through the two dimensional medium of a screen, whether that be a laptop, a desktop, or a mobile screen. So in a store, somebody can walk in, they can pick up um, they can pick up a, a cell phone case and touch it and feel it, see how much it weighs, feel how sturdy it is, is it tacky, is it shiny, any of the other features that might be important to a shopper. Since you can't do that on the internet, that information has to be conveyed through images and through text. EBC is enhanced brand content, and A plus content is essentially the same thing. They're just, EBC exists for those sellers that are using Seller Central from our poll question, and A plus exists for vendors who are using Vendor Central from our poll question. For the purposes of this, don't worry about the differences. Think of them as the same thing. They are additional high quality image content on a detail page that gives buyers a better understanding of what the heck they're buying, gives them more confidence that they're actually getting the product they were hoping for. And we've also seen, this is almost a, an ancillary benefit, is products and brands which are utilizing this content see a decrease in the amount of returns and customer complaints because their expectations are set accordingly. If people don't entirely know what they're buying or getting something different than what they expected, they tend to issue more returns, they want more refunds, they leave negative reviews, they're more upset. So these different enhanced branded uh, content modules increase conversion rate. And they increase conversion rate for organic traffic and for paid traffic too. So these end up being extremely valuable investments because if you're paying for that traffic on the front end to get people who search for a mattress topper to find your product, you might as well drive them back to a detail page that looks really great and increase the rate at which those people check out. You're essentially justifying that advertising investment and you're increasing your ROI. So, what are some of the takeaways? What are things that you can go back to your team and say, here are some ways, hey, half of us aren't selling on Amazon. If we do, here are some of the things that we need to think about coming out of the gates. The other half of you already are and mention that you want to rank higher on Amazon as your primary need. And so going back to your team and thinking, how do I rank higher? Keep this in mind. Keeping this in mind as the holy grail of the factors which are driving Amazon's organic rank algorithm which is to say, what are the things that matter when I'm trying to get my stuff found by more people? It's these direct factors, text match, price, it's sales velocity. How do I increase the rate at which I'm selling products? Selling products is just getting your thing found more, and when people find it, getting it purchased more. And advertising and content are two of the most powerful ways to do that. So when you think about this, and I think a study showed that people only remember like 20 to 25% of a given presentation. So if you take anything away from this, and assuming you ignore or forgot the other 80 some odd percent, it's consider text match relevancy, consider your content. There's actually two audiences for your content on Amazon, which might not be intuitive. You're writing that content for the machine, for Amazon's A9 algorithm, 
because Amazon is indexing that content and using that content for text match relevancy against a keyword query that a customer is inputting in the search bar. You're also writing that content for actual human shoppers who make it to your detail page and are making the decision, hey, is this compelling? Is this telling a story? Is this what I want? Leverage FBA, that's fulfillment by Amazon. If we go back to this, that's your fulfillment method bubble here in the bottom left in the indirect factors. Implement EBC and A+, that's the, the high quality content examples we talked about. Advertising, not just using advertising, we're at a place now on Amazon where the competition and the level of sophistication around advertising execution is fierce and it's a lot higher level than it was even six months a year ago. So there's advertising technology which exists out there that allows you to automate and get granular with that. Um, it might be a little bit of a shameless plug because at CPC we have that technology as well. Ours is called CapEx. There are many that exist out there um, in, in the world though, so depending on, on what suits your needs and, and what you're looking for. Whether you use CPCs or not, uh, using advertising technology is a really important piece to su su sustained success on Amazon. And again, at the end of the day, this is all about sales velocity. How do I get found more? Just sell more. And with that, Lauren, I don't know how if you want to kick off the, the Q&A. Yeah, excellent. Thanks so much, Pat. That was a lot of information. And that wrap up slide at the end was very valuable because, yeah, I believe that 20, what was it, 20 or 25 percent is usually remembered from a presentation. So Something like that, yeah, which is good <laughs> because it means that any of the stuff I said that was wrong is likely to be forgotten anyway. There you go. Well, it won't be forgotten if everyone um, opens your emails afterwards. We'll have a recap of the webinar. Uh, along with uh, video and we also have three handouts that will help everyone remember um, the points that were discussed today so if you look in your go-to webinar for those of you that joined after uh, we did our intro you'll see in the handout section three different PDFs I've had some Firefox users say they've had a hard time downloading them so we'll also be sending out links or the attachments in the wrap-up as well. If you're a Chrome user, they should go ahead and open up in your browser. But the, this is the first time we've done the, the PDF handout, so thank you for that, Pat. And uh, it's really cool to see them as part of this. So let's get into the Q&A. First of all, uh, we are Search Engine Journal, a very SEO-oriented audience. And one of the first questions that came in was, uh, do you have any specific tips for helping your Amazon product listing rank in Google for generic queries? So say I sell sunglasses on Amazon. I want um, that listing to uh, rank in Google, that Amazon listing to rank in Google for a term like wraparound sunglasses or, you know, blue tinted sunglasses, whatever. Do you have any tips on um, how to optimize within Amazon and then also outside of Amazon to help that rank itself in Google results? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, is even, it's actually, it's interesting because it's combining the two engines is how do I get my Amazon listing to show up for a Google search? And there, there's a couple of things to think about there is that an understanding of how Google's search engine works, right? And how they're scanning and indexing content as well. So the richness of the content on your Amazon detail page ends up becoming a factor for Google. And so some of the things that you can do with that in mind is that you want to maximize all your keyword character space that Amazon gives you for title, for bullet points, and for descriptions, which essentially make up the indexable on-page content of your Amazon detail page. So for example, let's say that you have 60 available characters for your title for a product detail page. You could just to satisfy the title field, and this would work, say blue water bottle, great. And so that means you're only really ever going to rank for blue water bottle. And that's all you're giving Google or Amazon to index from a content standpoint. If in contrast, you say 32 ounce stainless steel, double walled uh, straw sip, um, 24 hour ice cold hydro flask water bottle, right? Which obviously that's just happened what I'd be looking at right now. You're now able to index and rank for all of those different terms, the more terms you rank for, the greater possibility you're getting found through those different search queries, and you essentially maximize the total pie of potential search queries that you can show up for. Does that make sense? 
Absolutely, very good tip. I'm also sure you search for that when you're making that water bottle purchase. <laughs> oh, very, very specific. Very specific. And you know, another tip, and I've seen Google warn against this recently, is um, you know, treat each marketplace as its own kind of content hub, and just like you would not want to have various pages on your website that have the same exact duplicate content. Uh, don't fall within that trap of uploading the same product descriptions to Amazon, to Jet, to Walmart Marketplace, to Google Shopping, to everywhere else, because you're going to have content, you're going to have cross-platform content cannibalization at the end of the day. So all of those pieces are going to be competing. They're going to be duplicates of each other, and you're not necessarily going to have that original content that people are looking for anyway. So taking the time... Um, to adding to the content and, and possibly even writing for each audience or, or uh, consumer segment across those platforms makes a lot of sense as well. And then even if you're something like uh, maybe you're a, a dog food or dog toy company, you also have the Chewies of the world and various other vertical marketplaces. So you don't want to have your content being the same. You have a better chance of getting those rankings within Google if your content is differentiated between platforms too. Yeah, Lauren, that's a, that's a good point. One of the things just to tack on here before we move on is, is one of the things we, we talk about is channel-specific success requires channel-specific strategies. And so, as I mentioned, we're working with Facebook, Google, Instagram, Amazon, and content needs to be differentiated for each of those. You can't just copy and paste titles from your website and put them on Amazon, especially, and you alluded to this, Google's looking for unique content. They don't want to see that content copy and pasted across multiple channels. Amazon's looking for compelling content. Compelling content meaning what's the content that's getting people to actually convert and make a purchase. So that's that's a that's a good point you brought up. So speaking of compelling content, let's get back into Amazon. Um, I got a lot of questions about user reviews, and one of the first ones was how um, important are reviews in terms of being an A9 ranking factor? Yeah, good question. So I, I want to take a moment to to talk about that. Is that Amazon is not actually scanning the number of reviews and the review score in order to show where products rank. You can do a search for sunglasses or for wireless mouse or for whatever it might be. And you could see, oh, this product has 800 reviews and it, it, it four and a half stars and it ranks below another product that has 35 reviews. How could that be? So Amazon is not just using how many re product reviews does the product have and what the review score to rank products. Where the reviews come into play is that it has an impact on conversion rate. So a product that is reviewed better and has more reviews is more likely to convert at a higher rate than a product that has less reviews. As you can imagine too, and just put your shopper hat on, there's a, a diminishing marginal utility at some point, which is to say that you know the difference between the, the 5,000th review and the 5,010th review doesn't really matter at that point, where you really want to think about is how do I get to 25 reviews? How do I just get there? And that's a good starting point because once you at least get to that point, you're giving buyers confidence. Okay, this product's been rated pretty highly. You want to be at least four star, ideally a four and a half star. And at least 25 people have left those reviews. Uh, and that gives people the buyer confidence to convert. The conversion is what drives the sales velocity. And so that's the domino effect of how those reviews actually impact the, the search ranking. But it's not just the pure number of reviews themselves. Excellent, thank you for that. So as soon as we started talking about reviews, I got a lot of questions coming in about uh, fake product reviews. And, um, <clears throat> first of all, does Amazon have any measures in place to guard against fake reviews? Are they doing anything to combat it? And um, some folks have mentioned that they think that their competitors have fake reviews and that's helping them rank higher. Yeah, this is a this is a really hot topic in the marketplace. It has been since about 2015. Um, I actually even I called the for any baseball fans out there. We we called early 2016 kind of the steroid era of reviews on on Amazon. And so the, the Amazon has done. I should be clear too, if any Amazon folks are listening. Amazon has done a, a lot better job in the last six months specifically in terms of cleaning up review manipulation. So there used to be a tremendous amount of black hat tactics, specifically the most um, 
the most popular one, and I'm not breaking any news here, was just incentivized reviews where sellers and brands were reaching out to people and basically buying reviews and say, hey, I'll, I'll give you $5 or I'll give you this product for 99% off or for free if you go on the detail page and you leave a review. So Amazon explicitly outlawed that in their October 2016 update to their prohibited policies. And since then, and especially in 2018, they've been extremely aggressive in removing fake reviews. They've done this through a number of, a number of prongs. One is through fake reviewer accounts. So it's not just by product, but they found that about half of their top reviewer community were really just review bots. And so they purged all of those accounts from the marketplace. They went by product and of course they have all the data so they can see any unnatural patterns in review accrual. If a product was getting two or three reviews a day and then all of a sudden they started, excuse me, getting 500 reviews in a given day, Amazon can see that that's an unnatural pattern. So they would pull that down. And then the third prong is they would also see given sellers or brands where they would be getting accruing fake reviews frequently and they've been policing that. So we've seen literal millions of reviews pulled from the marketplace this year. And Amazon is, is taking that, not because necessarily they care about your brand or they care about the reviews, but they really care about consumer trust Consumer trust is a big part of what keeps Amazon growing at the rate that it does. And once that trust breaks, people stop trusting to, to go there. So they've done a lot to improve in that. Will there always be bad actors who are trying to manipulate the system for their own game? gain? Of course there are. I mean, that's happened in Google since the Google search engine existed as well. That, that profit incentive will always be there, but they've done a much better job of, of putting those safeguards in place to, to limit that. Excellent. Thank you. So, you know, speaking of uh, fake reviews and um, the velocity of reviews being kind of a red flag on um, the Amazon spam cleanup team, I guess, mm -hmm. how would uh, the next batch of questions that naturally came in were, were uh, how, how would you recommend a, um, a vendor ask their uh, their audience or buyers for reviews do you have any do you have any tips and strategies to encourage reviews on Amazon without necessarily uh, hitting that um, hitting that switch you're discussing yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom the question out a little bit into just saying how do I get reviews in a way that's compliant with Amazon's TOS because I think that's really at the core of the of the question um, and for anybody who's trying to ask a roundabout way of like, what's the new black hat ta uh, hack or tactic for getting reviews, I would say just stop. Just don't don't even try to hack the system. You're more likely to get yourself suspended. It, it's not going to work in the in the long run. Um, I'm, I'm just saying that genuinely. We've seen sellers get suspended. We've seen people try stuff. That's not what we that's not what we do, and it's just never a sustainable business practice. So I would stay away from that. As for things that you can do we're out of the, the steroid era, so to speak, and review gains are all marginal now, meaning how can you just get the rate of reviews from half a percent to three quarters of a percent or from three quarters of a percent to one percent? And there are a couple of things that you can do. If you're a vendor, you can use the Amazon Vine program. It is pretty expensive, but essentially you can get Amazon to send some of your inventory to their Vine reviewers. And then those reviewers will leave honest reviews on the page a misconception is that you're paying for five-star reviews, which is not true. You're paying for honest reviews. If people use your product and it's not good and it doesn't work and it doesn't work as advertised or it's poor quality, they're going to let people know that too. So it's not guaranteed positive reviews. It's just that they will leave honest reviews. Some things you can do as a seller are there are automated messaging systems out there that actually work through an API with your buyer seller messaging system within your seller central account and you can reach out to people you just want to reach out and make sure that you are a hundred percent abiding by amazon's tos so you don't want to say oh you know, go to my my you know here's a 10 percent off discount go to my page and leave a review you really just as a customer service function function asking if people need any help with their order have any questions and if they want to leave a review where they can go do it Amazon now has opt-outs for those emails too, so they are even less effective now than they were maybe a, a, a year ago. Again, and this is a frustrating answer, but it is the truth, the number one most important thing, the powerful thing you can do to increase reviews 
is just increase the number of sales. If you're getting a 1% review rate on your product and you sell 10 products, you're going to get less reviews than if you sell 100 products or 1,000 products. So even if that review rate remains constant, but you're driving a larger pool of reviewers because you're selling more, you're going to see that reflect in your reviews. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, let's uh, get out of reviews for a second and, and, and talk about inventory. So uh, if products are launched within Amazon and, and say they quickly sell out or someone quickly runs out of inventory and then once the inventory is replenished, does that period where there is nothing available negatively affect A9 ranking? Massively. Yeah. So the cost of stocking out is really high and the cost of stocking out goes beyond just, okay, I sell 10 units a day. I was out of stock for three days. I'm back in stock on day four. Therefore my net loss and cost must, must just be the units I would have sold for those three days I was out of stock. It's keep in mind that graphic where sales velocity sits at the center. You now have to, it's the cost of the sales you've lost. It's your new ranking, which is now you're ranked much lower than where you were ranked previously because of the loss in sales velocity and whatever investment you now have to put in, whether that be through a promotion, through a sale, through more advertising to recoup that loss, to restore your place in the rankings. So I can't stress this enough. One of the most damaging things you can do to your ranking on Amazon is to stock out. Excellent. Thank you. So I, I'm sure that's helpful for a lot of folks as well, especially those that have stocked out. Just avoid it by all costs. Um, next question. Uh, you, you discussed price as being um, a ranking factor in A9. Is that specifically a lower price or a more appealing price? Interesting. I guess I guess that begs the question, is there a case where a lower price is not a more appealing price. Um, but yes, it, it does mean lower price. So it, it, Amazon's a tough place to sell for luxury products. So if you even, if you look for iPhone case, you're going to find the first page probably averages eight to $10. You're going to find a lot of essentially cheap quality products that are on there. And Amazon uses price as a direct factor factor. So they're actually scanning and saying, okay, if you have a lower price, you're more likely to show up higher on the SERP. It also has an impact on sales velocity because of course, lower priced products tend to sell more than higher priced products because of the low price. So it has a twofold impact, that price. But yeah, lower, lower price, Amazon is essentially giving a boost to that in the rankings and then that's furthered by the fact that people buy them at an increasing rate. But you also have to think about this relative to the search term. So if somebody is searching for, you know, luxury high-end sheets, then maybe they're expecting a higher general price and they're not looking for a pair of, you know, $15 sheets. And so it's all going to be relative to what keyword you're trying to, to rank for. Yeah, if you're selling a, a, a $50 luxury water bottle, you're probably not going to rank on that page one for water bottle because the market has enough six, seven, eight, nine dollar products that are going to take up those spaces but maybe you, you can rank higher for a specific search for your brand or for uh, you know, anything with high-end quality, uh, you know, luxury attached to those search terms, if that makes sense. And is that price specifically for the product or is that also product price plus shipping cost? Product, because, go ahead. Because I'll find, right, so on the appealing side, right, I'll do a search and I'll see that you know, nine water bottles on the page are twelve dollars and then there's one that's three dollars right and i automatically click on the three dollar one and i see that has a uh, ten dollar shipping and handling as compared to the others which may be prime or, or whatnot so uh, are we looking at total price here as, as a factor or price plus shipping and then of course there's the the prime right layer on top of that as well so, and so two-part question um how does the shipping cost enter into the pricing equation, then how much of an advantage, how much of an advantage does a uh, merchant have if they're utilizing the prime system? Yeah, good, good question. So first question, it's a fully baked price that I'm talking about. So the product price plus shipping, 
I remember this is going way back where there was a seller who tried to sell a, an HD TV for one cent with, I think it was like $700 in shipping. And so they were trying to, of course, see if they could get around that. Not surprisingly, Amazon considered that. And so the, the price that they're using is the full all in price plus shipping. Uh, from a perception standpoint, that's a good thing to think about too. There is human psychology, which really values free shipping. So if you have a product for $20 and $5 in shipping, if you just have that product be $25 and free shipping, I guarantee you, you'll see an increase in sales almost overnight. People see free shipping and it's more attractive. Uh, even if you bake that price into the product price, you're paying the same commission to Amazon. Amazon lumps those in together for commission purposes and for the organic ranking purpose, it's using both of those as well. So I would just try to make your products as much as possible be free shipping if you're not using FBA. To the FBA portion of the question, and FBA is fulfillment by Amazon. This is where Amazon is actually warehousing those products themselves at their vast network of FCs, fulfillment centers. And those products are prime eligible, which is why if you're a prime member, you can get them in two days, or if you're not a prime member, you hit the whatever it is, I think $35 spend threshold. There is also seller fulfilled prime where you can be prime eligible without using Amazon's warehouse, but let's put that aside for a moment. And the question was around, is there a significant conversion impact from using, from having prime eligible product? The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, it varies by, by category. And in some categories, using FBA is difficult. Maybe if you have, you know, large furniture, like a, a um, you know, chase lounge or outdoor uh, kids play set, those kinds of things. It makes it more tricky. But generally speaking, we'll see conversion rates on prime eligible products as much as double or greater the conversion rate of non prime eligible products. If you look at the marketplace, everybody's using prime now. It used to be a competitive, competitive advantage. It's essentially table stakes at this point. When I'm talking to a brand, if they're serious about selling on Amazon, using FBA and becoming prime eligible is almost a, a non-decision. It's almost a must. Yeah, as a consumer, I don't even really consider anything. It's not oh, prime. Unless same. I can't buy it. I mean, give it to me now. I cannot we, wait well, we've, three days. We've been, we've been trained as consumers that we're, that thing's going to be here. Excellent. And that answers some of the questions that we had about delivery time becoming a factor too, right? So if it's a piece of furniture, you're probably talking multiple delivery time, if it's something that's within, I'm sorry, was it FBA? And FBA, F yes, FBA. fulfillment by Amazon. You're talking Prime, so um, of course Amazon's going to give a preference to that. Pat, thank you very much. You've really laid out, I mean, for me being more of an SEO person and kind of dabbling a little bit in Amazon, this has been so educational. Um, Judging by the uh, response, uh, the poll responses, the questions that we've gotten, um, I'd say the same for the viewers out there. Do not forget to download the handouts, uh, which are part of the webinar today. And also we'll be sending a recap out to everyone uh, with the handouts with more information about CPC strategy. And any questions that we did not get a chance to answer, there were a lot of them. There were a lot of publisher-oriented ones. Uh, we'll be sending over to Pat and his team to be able to take care of them. We'll include some of those answers in the uh, wrap up as well. Um, <clears throat> just to let everyone know uh, before we let you go, our next uh, SEJ think tank will be a BOSS webinar. BOSS stands for the best of SEJ Summit. So we're going to have Perna Verge, uh, Senior Manager Global Engagement at Microsoft discussing AI, uh, just like the world of Amazon and Alexa, uh, everything at Microsoft and Cortana is very voice search, very AI driven. So that should be a very nice follow-up. Again, thank you very much, Pat. Is there anything you'd like to tell our viewers and listeners before we let you go? No, just to, to Lauren, thank you for having me and thank you to everybody to, from spending some of your, your time. I hope you learned something and, and absolutely feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Absolutely. Thank you. And just to let you all know before uh, we sign off, uh, there will be a quick survey at the end of the webinar. Please take the time to fill that out. It'll be great feedback and information for us and for the team at CPC Strategy. So again, thank you. And we're signing off. Bye. Thank you, guys.